Okay, so we're beginning our look at the 1980s, starting with the Reagan years, uh, which were you know the, Ra the years that Ronald Reagan was our president. Uh, he, Ronald Reagan was elected in the 1980 presidential election, but uh, took office in January of 1981 and served <clears throat> until uh, January of 1989. So he, his presidency encompassed most of the 1980s, eight years out of the 10 years that make up that decade. And so um, that's where we start our look. Our learning objectives for this first section, there are only two. Explain how Reagan handled the Cold War and describe Reagan's economic policies. So we'll start off by looking at the 1980 election. Ronald Reagan, a former actor who was the governor of California from 1967 to 1965, defeated incumbent Jimmy Carter, taking 50.7% of the popular vote and won by a landslide in the Electoral College. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, Reagan had, had been an actor. He was well-known, but was mostly what we'd probably call a B-level actor. Um, but still, nonetheless, was well-known, well-liked, um, and had made the transition into politics and like I said, he had been governor of California from 1967 through 1975. He had uh, attempted to run at the White House in 1976. But uh, in 1980, not only did he win the elect, uh, Republican nomination, but then won uh, the 1980 election, as we said, won by a landslide in the Electoral College, which you can see here. Uh, the red states went to Reagan, blue states went to Carter. So as you can see, Carter, he won a few, uh, including uh, Minnesota and his home state of Georgia, but um, won very few other states. Uh, <clears throat> reasons why Carter lost. Number one, his inability to fix the economy. <clears throat> And number two, the inability to end the hostage crisis. And three, a general sense that the nation was headed downward. Many Americans just didn't feel good about the direction the country was headed, and they blamed Carter. <clears throat> now we'll contrast that with the reasons why Reagan won. So, you know, the last look were reasons why Carter lost. Uh, reasons why Carter didn't do well. Here we look at specific reasons why Reagan won, or why Reagan did do well. So these are positive factors for Reagan. Conservatives in general were gaining strength. Many Americans saw Reagan as someone who could solve the country's problems, and Reagan gained support of the religious right. And this is really kind of the first time that we really began to see uh, evangelical Christians voting as a voting block, and they began to mobilize behind um, behind conservatives, something that they still enjoy today. So here's as we look at you know the difference between conservatives and liberals. Uh, conservatives believe that the economy improves with less government involvement. They believe in lower taxes and smaller government. They believe that most of the country's problems are moral issues, which can be solved by religious faith. They also believe that tax cuts for the wealthy will lead to improvements in the economy, as the wealthy will invest the saved money, and that the benefits will trickle down throughout the economy. Liberals, on the other hand, believe that we need more government regulation and programs. They believe that the government uh, should use social programs to solve the problems of the disadvantaged, and that taxes on the rich should pay for these programs. They also believe that our social problems stem from the unequal distribution of income. And these are just you know, generalizations. That's not to say that every conservative will completely agree with all the points of the conservatives, or that every liberal will completely agree with every point on here as well. But it's just these are generalities. Well, generally what conservatives believe 
generally speaking, what liberals believe. Conservative coalition. <clears throat> um, many Americans believe that the nation had moved away from the traditional values during the 1960s and the 1970s. So those you know, traditional values that had been held through the 1950s, many Americans felt like, you know, all of a sudden we were moving away from those traditional values in the 60s and 70s. The high inflation of the 1960s and 1970s had hurt the middle class, and many religious Americans were shocked by Supreme Court decisions that limited prayer in public schools and by the Roe v. Wade decision that supported abortion. Many of these groups pulled together and helped conservative politicians like Reagan gain strength. And that brings us to the moral majority. Televangelists like Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell used television to reach people with their message. The moral majority was founded by Falwell, who used his television show, The Old Time Gospel Hour, to promote his conservative political agenda. And of course, uh, both Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell are still around today, uh, still have a television presence, and still largely focus on politics. Um, and so, you know, once again, this represented that shift, this moral majority uh, gave strength and support to this this conservative coalition. Uh, I remember, coalition is where you have different groups that may not all agree that kind of come together. And so the moral majority kind of became part of that, this group of conservatives that all held conservative values and began pushing a conservative agenda. And this, of course, benefited Reagan and other conservatives. The Iranian hostage crisis ends. As a final insult to Carter, moments after being sworn in as a 40th president, Reagan received word that the hostages were on a plane and had left Iranian airspace. Reagan made the announcement that the hostage crisis was over. Uh, this also helped add to Reagan's popularity, uh, although it had, had been Carter who had negotiated the release, but, you know, like I said, a final insult. The Ayatollah did not release the hostages until moments after Reagan had been sworn in. Reagan is shot <clears throat> on March 30th, 1981, just 69 days into his presidency. Reagan was shot by John Hinckley Jr. while leaving a speaking engagement in Washington, D.C. Three others were shot, including James Brady, who was shot in the head. And we'll talk about James Brady when we begin to look at the Clinton years. Uh, because a, a uh, gun control bill, known as the Brady Bill, was named after James Brady, and that passed during the Clinton era. Um, <clears throat> Reagan himself suffered a punctured lung, but with prompt medical attention, he recovered quickly. Now, the uh, the attack on Reagan was carried out, so this man, John Hinckley Jr., uh, was really delusional, and... Uh, was infatuated with an actress named Jodie Foster, and he believed by killing the president, he could attract the attention of Jodie Foster. And we're going to watch a little video clip here on the attempted assassination. The air traffic controller strike. Shortly into Reagan's first term, air traffic controllers went on strike. Reagan declared the situation an emergency and threatened to fire the air traffic controllers if they did not return to work. When they failed to return, he fired more than 11,000 striking controllers, and thus kind of showing where he stood with regards to the unions and that he was willing to stand up to public unions. Reaganomics. This is a term that came to describe what Reagan believed relating to the economy or his economic policies became known as Reaganomics. Reagan believed that the economy would grow when marginal tax rates were low enough to spur investment. He employed supply-side economics. Critics labeled this trickle-down economics. Reagan attempted to cut government spending for social programs. Reagan increased government spending on defense because he believed in peace through strength. 
So in other words, he felt it was important that we maintain a strong national defense. And in order to pay for that, he did, um, didn't want to raise taxes, so he had to cut government spending elsewhere. And one of the areas he looked was to cut social programs. Um, but the increased defense spending also caused deficit spending. <clears throat> Reagan also believed that some problems were caused by government regulation so he began to take, take steps to deregulate several industries. And here's a quote from Ronald Reagan that pretty much sums up his view of government. The nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So here's our checking for understanding question. Describe Reagan's economic policy. Now we look at Reagan's court appointments. Reagan nominated Sandra Day O'Connor to the Supreme Court. She was the first female on the court. And he also appointed William Rehnquist, the most conservative justice, to replace retiring Chief Justice Warren Burger. Then we hit the 1984 presidential election. Uh, the Democratic nominee, Walter Mondale, chose Geraldine Ferraro the first woman to run on a major party ticket as his running mate. <clears throat> so now, Ferraro is not the only woman to have run on a major party ticket. She was just the first. Um, in the 2008 presidential election, Sarah Palin was chosen as John McCain's running mate, becoming the second woman to run on a major party ticket. And, and that gave each party, uh, Democrats with Ferraro, Republicans with, with Palin, uh, a female vice presidential candidate and in different, of course, years, um, some 24 years apart. But, you know, nonetheless, it was, it was groundbreaking, especially at this point in time, to have a woman on the ticket. <clears throat> Unfortunately for M Mondale, uh, that wasn't enough to help him. Reagan won in a landslide, taking every electoral vote except for Mondale's home state of Minnesota and the District of Columbia. Peace through strength. As I mentioned before, Reagan felt that we needed to remain strong as a deterrent against other aggression, particularly Soviet aggression. Reagan engaged in a new arms race with the Soviet Union. He believed that the U.S. needed to be strong as a deterrent to communist aggression, and he also believed that the Soviet Union's economy could not handle a new arms race. And he really proved to be true, because ultimately uh, it put tremendous strain on the economic resources of the Soviet Union, leading to their collapse in 1991. We also secretly supported the Mujahideen in Afghanistan when they were fighting the Soviet Union. Uh, which, you know, that war in Afghanistan has been equated to the Soviet Union's Vietnam. In other words, what the Vietnam War was to us in terms of a long, drawn-out, expensive conflict, Afghanistan became to the Soviets. They spent 10 years there and ultimately didn't achieve victory and ended up withdrawing. And, of course, it was a considerable expense for them, uh, which, of course, the fact that we supported the Mujahideen added to that expense. Uh, the downside is, is that we now know that Osama bin Laden was there fighting with the Mujahideen who we were equipping. And of course, right about that time uh, was when Al Qaeda was founded in Afghanistan by bin Laden. And so, you know, oddly enough, uh, he ends up becoming our enemy. Uh, but there was another downside to this uh, support of the Mujahideen and, and also um, the increased or the new arms race with the Soviet Union. The increased military spending increased budget deficits from $80 billion to $200 billion. Plus, Reagan also re, re, um, increased the payroll, payroll withholding for uh, programs like... Um, 
Social Security, or actually specifically for Social Security, with the justification that the baby boomers were in their working years and that they would benefit during their retirement years. However, um, then we borrowed from that, which <clears throat> we've continued to do ever since, and that has created a situation where, in effect, that borrowing has passed the burden on to future generations. It's like a tax on on the future or a future tax, uh, because you know it's the future taxpayers that are going to have to make up that difference and repay that money. The Reagan Doctrine. The U.S. provided both overt and covert aid to right-wing guerrillas and resistance movements in an effort to undermine Soviet-backed governments in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Now, overt aid is out in the open. Covert aid is secret. So, you know, you know, we, we both kind of provided some secret money as well as just some very, you know, outright, out in the open funding to these, to these right-wing guerrillas. <clears throat> in addition to the support of the Mujahideen, Reagan also supported the Contras in Nicaragua who were fighting against the communist Sandinista regime. Now, try to keep that in mind because we'll be talking again about the Contras in just a little bit. And this brings us to Reagan and the Cold War. Reagan took a hard line against the Soviet Union, but he also recognized the change in leadership of the Soviet Union and shifted to diplomacy. So, you know, early on, he had labeled the Soviet Union an evil empire, but when he saw the changes in leadership under Mikhail Gorbachev, he recognized that this was somebody that he could kind of work with and make progress towards peace. Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev and Reagan held four summits between 1985 and 1988. They signed the INF Treaty, banning a whole class of nuclear weapons. Reagan traveled to the Berlin Wall, where he gave a, a speech, which this is a quote from that speech by Ronald Reagan. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and for Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I, don't, I think he would have been surprised by how fast that actually happened as the wall came down in 1989. So, explain how Reagan handled the Cold War. And now, we look at some other international conflicts during the Reagan years. Okay, here we look at, uh, now we're going to start looking at some other areas during the Reagan administration. We start by looking at Gaddafi, uh, Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi began sponsoring acts of terror around the world. And then on April 15, 1986, under Reagan's orders, the United States launched airstrikes against targets in Libya in retaliation for numerous acts of terrorism sponsored by Gaddafi. Uh, we also know that Gaddafi was behind the, uh, the Pan Am Flight 103 bombing over Lockerbie, Scotland. And um, so, you know, that was, I mean, just one of many acts that he had been uh, involved as a sponsor of terror. Um, he did kind of quiet down there for a while. Recently, of course, he's been in the news along with the Libyan revolution where he was, um, his regime was toppled and he was uh, captured and executed or killed. Well, I won't say it wasn't like a formal execution, but he was no, executed. Yeah, he was. He was killed. He was shot and killed uh, by his captors. Um, but anyway, so that happened during the Reagan administration. We also took military action in Grenada. Uh, on October 25, 1983, Reagan ordered U.S. forces to invade Grenada, where a 1979 coup d'etat had established an independent, non-aligned Marxist-slash-Leninist government. So this was a communist government that was not aligned directly with the Soviet Union. A formal appeal from the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States led to the intervention of U.S. forces. President Reagan also cited an allegedly regional threat posed by a Soviet-Cuban military buildup 
in the Caribbean and concern for the safety of several hundred American medical students at St. George's University as adequate reasons to invade. The Iran-Contra affair. In late 1986, news broke of secret illegal dealings that involved the sale of arms to Iran, possibly in exchange for the release of American hostages in Lebanon. Funds from those sales were diverted to assist the Contras in Nicaragua, who we talked about before. They were fighting against the communist Sandinista regime. There was great debate over what Reagan knew and when he knew it. The scandal was compounded when Oliver North destroyed or hid pertinent documents between November 21st and November 25th, 1986. The parties convicted had their convictions overturned on appeal. Public opinion was divided. The Strategic Defense Initiative. Reagan pushed for the development of a defense system to use ground and space systems to protect the U.S. from nuclear missiles. It was called the Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI, but was commonly referred to as Star Wars. And here's a quote from Reagan on nuclear weapons. I call upon the scientific community in our, in our country, those who gave us nuclear weapons, to turn their great talents now to the cause of mankind and world peace, to give us the means of rendering these nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. Here we have a look at life in the 1980s. Uh, overall, the economy improved through the 1980s. Wealth and power were glamorized through television shows like the lifestyles of the rich and famous, Dynasty, and Dallas. Pictured here, we see the cast of the uh, TV show Dallas, which was about an oil-rich um, Texas family. And yuppies, yuppies or young urban professionals were the ambitious money makers from the baby boom generation. By the mid-1990s, the top 5% of Americans earned more than 20% of the nation's income. And here you see the cast of the TV show 30-something, which I believe debuted in the late 80s, carried into the early 90s, if memory serves me correct. Um, and they depicted yuppies. And speaking of kind of the glorification of wealth and power, uh, here was a poster known as the Justification for Higher Education, a uh, poster I had on my wall when I was in college, kind of as inspiration for me, and unfortunately I didn't end up with this house or those cars, but, uh, but it was my motivation to get through college. News and entertainment. Ted Turner founded the cable news network CNN, the first dedicated 24-hour cable news channel. Prior to that, we didn't have these 24-hour news cycles. We tended to have network news, which had its regular times in the morning, at noon, evening news, and then the late night news. Uh, but with CNN, 24 hours around the clock news. Uh, he also founded WTBS, which pioneered the super station concept in cable television. And music videos also became popular in the 80s. WTBS showed videos on Friday and Saturday nights on a program called Night Tracks. And then MTV was launched in 1981, and it initially showed music videos 24 hours per day. Now, of course, many people wear MTV shows, a lot of reality shows now, not so much the, uh, the music videos, but that was initially what they showed 24 hours a day um, throughout the 80s. It was very popular in the 1980s. Video games. The 1980s was when video games first became popular, and one of the earliest popular video game consoles was the Atari, pictured here. Just Say No to Drugs. First Lady Nancy Reagan began the Just Say No to Drugs campaign. Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Uh, MAD was founded in 1980 in response to numerous deaths attributed to drunk drivers. AIDS. In 1981, scientists identified a new disease called AIDS that weakened the human immune system, making victims susceptible to secondary infections that would eventually lead to death. It was first discovered in Africa, but spread the fastest in the U.S., initially amongst the homosexual population. Specifically, male homosexuals were uh, within that community where we initially saw uh, it's spreading the fastest in the early 
early years of our awareness of this disease. Um, and this helped give rise to the gay activist movement. The AIDS epidemic drew attention to the gay activist movement. And pictured here is the uh, AIDS memorial quilt in Washington, D.C. Uh, each quilt contains many squares dedicated to uh, the memory of those people that, that have died due to this disease. The American Association of Retired Persons. With a growing population of retired persons, the American Association of Retired Persons, or AARP, became a major lobbying force. The space shuttle. NASA conducted test flights in 1981 and began operational flights in 1982. The space shuttle was a reusable spacecraft, which was a break from the, the previous crafts that were used once and then rendered obsolete. Uh, in 1986, the space shuttle Challenger exploded on takeoff. And now we'll watch a, a video of the original live TV footage uh, of that, and then another video of Ronald Reagan's comments uh, to the nation when he addressed the nation after the tragedy. T minus 15 seconds. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start. 4, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. Engines beginning throttling down now at 94%. Normal throttles uh, for most of the flight, 104%. We'll throttle down to 65% uh, shortly. 257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles. Downrange distance 3 nautical miles. Engines throttling up. Three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go with throttle up. Challenger, go with throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity 2,900 feet per second. Altitude 9 nautical miles. Downrange distance 7 nautical miles. dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. Flight director confirms that. We are uh, looking at uh, checking with the recovery forces to see uh, what can be done at this point. This is Mission Control Houston. We have no additional word at this time.
Uh, they uh, point approximately 28.64 uh, degrees north, uh, 80.28 uh, degrees west. We are awaiting uh, verification from uh, uh, as to the location of the recovery forces in the field to, to see what uh, may be possible at this point. space stations and satellites. The 1980s also saw major progress in the development of space stations and satellites. International cooperation has helped with the development of space stations. <clears throat> Here once again we have a look as a graphic organizer looking at the differences between liberals and conservatives in terms of their beliefs and once again in you know uh, by design, the liberals are on the left because they are said to be on the left end of the political spectrum, <clears throat> and conservatives are said to be to the right. So, looking at the beliefs of liberals, the liberals in general believe that we need more government regulation and programs. <clears throat> we need social programs to help the disadvantaged. Programs should be paid for by, uh, by taxes on the rich and problems arise from the unequal distribution of wealth. As where conservatives on the right end of the spectrum believe we need less government. Tax cuts for the wealthy will trickle down through the economy. Most of our problems are moral and can be solved by religious faith and government regulation hurts the economy. And here we have a graphic organizer of the Iran-Contra affair. Um, whoops. I don't know how that jumped pages there on me. Okay, so once again, looking at the Iran-Contra affair, uh, the three parties involved, the United States, Iran, and the Contras. The United States sold arms to Iran, possibly in exchange for hostages. The funds were sent to aid the Contras. Iran purchased arms from the United States, the Contras received aid to fight the communist Sandinistas. And now we begin our look at the Bush administration. The Bush administration lasted from 1989, January of 89, through January of 1993, four-year term. Our learning objectives for this unit is to explain how the collapse of the Soviet Union affected U.S. foreign policy. <clears throat> you should be able to explain why the U.S. went to war in the Persian Gulf in 1991 and should be able to explain why Bush's approval rating fell prior to the 1992 election. So here we have George H.W. Bush. Uh, the H.W. stood for Herbert Walker. And generally speaking, we, we did not refer to him as George H.W. Bush at the time, but subsequent to his son, George W. Bush, being elected, um, we commonly use the middle initials, and so the Herbert Walker is uh, now commonly used. So George H. W. Bush, who had been the vice president during the Reagan administration, won the presidency in 1988, taking 54 percent of the popular vote, which is a fairly large chunk of the popular vote. He defeated Michael Dukakis, taking 426 electoral votes, but the Democrats retained control of Congress. And the thing to note about, um, about George W. Bush being the vice president under Reagan, Reagan was still pretty popular and had pretty high approval ratings. The economy had been very strong, particularly in towards the later years of, of Reagan's presidency. Uh, 
you know, as a result, American Sunday felt pretty good about the direction the country was going. And so there was kind of a transference of those favorable opinions about Reagan to Bush, who was his vice president. <clears throat> so, now we have a look here at Jesse Jackson. Uh, Jesse Jackson became the first African American to make a serious bid for the presidency, finishing second to Dukakis in the Democratic primaries. Jackson worked to build what he called a rainbow coalition by attempting to gain the support of minorities and the poor. Now looking at changes in the Soviet Union, and we already kind of saw this in the Reagan years, but the Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, ushered in an era of change in the Soviet Union to fix the problems with the Soviet economy. He used perestroika, or restructuring. So he began to restructure the Soviet economy to include some elements of capitalism. He also promoted glasnost, or openness, by allowing greater freedom of religion and speech. This was significant because, uh, you know, typically the church had, had, you know, very much freedom during, you know, under communism, where atheism really was the official doctrine. And speech, free speech had been suppressed, but now people could now speak out against the government. Unfortunately, or while Gorbachev didn't intend it, these changes ultimately enabled the forces that led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. <clears throat> so, communist nations fall. Mostly peaceful revolutions spread throughout Eastern Europe in 1989. Uh, there are a wide variety of reasons for this. Part of it, Gorbachev had announced the end of the Brezhnev Doctrine. Uh, former, former Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev had issued what became known as the Brezhnev Doctrine, which was a policy statement that the Soviets would protect communist governments in Eastern Europe if they were threatened. But under under Gorbachev, he's announced that they're abandoning that doctrine. And that, that was mostly done for financial reasons. The Soviet Union was under too great a financial strain to try to protect those communist governments. But that abandoning of the Brezhnev doctrine signaled to the communist nations in Eastern Europe that they now had a chance to try to overthrow their communist governments without Soviet interference. Uh, one of the first to fall, really, was, was Poland. And well, actually, in fact, really, Poland really paved the way where the Catholic Church kind of became a rallying point and a spot where uh, there was tremendous organization of a trade union called Solidarity. And their leader, Lech Walesa, ended up being elected president uh, of, of a new anti-communist uh, Poland, after communism peacefully exited Poland. And then other communist governments began to fall. Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania, and Bulgaria all threw off their communist governments. And like I said, most of this was peaceful, although not in every instance, but uh, there was, you know, wasn't too much resistance. Then the Berlin Wall was torn down in 1989, and this, of course, opened up uh, those borders that had separated East and West Germany and had been in, in, in place, you know, dating back to what the wall was erected, um, what, I think 1961. So, you know, here you had a, a, a wall that's been standing for nearly 30 years, and now, it, now it's finally torn down, and that separation is no longer there. People are freely uh, allowed to go back and forth between the two Germanys. And within a year, Germany was reunited now as a sovereign nation. 
that have been separated ever since 1945, and now all of a sudden it's reunited 45 years later as, you know, now an independent, sovereign nation uh, under one government again. Then the Soviet Union collapses. In August of 1991, Gorbachev survived an attempted coup or overthrow through the help of Boris Yeltsin. The coup was attempted by hardliners in the Soviet government that were resisting reforms. So, you know, many of these hardliners, they, they didn't like the change that was ushered in by, by Gorbachev, and so they tried to overthrow him. Yeltsin, who was the Russian president, provided assistance um, to, to help protect Gorbachev. Other republics then declared their independence from the Soviet Union. And then in November, Gorbachev said that the Soviet Union no longer existed. Boris Yeltsin, the president of Russia, now led an independent Russian government and the Cold War was over. And so this brought about a very rapid change because here we had gone through, you know, in effect, 45 years of Cold War, of tensions between the two great superpowers in the world, where everything that both countries did internationally was always kind of viewed through the Cold War. What effect was it going to have on the Cold War? And now, really, pretty rapidly, it all disintegrated within just a couple of years. And all of a sudden, it's gone. And we have a new world. And in fact, that brings us to Bush's term for this new post-Cold War world. He said a new world order existed. And so a new world order really was how, you know, the, you know, the term that Bush used to describe the post-Cold War world. Uh, the anti-communist movements spread from Europe to China. In fact, Chinese students began uh, a protest in the city of Beijing, in a large public square known as Tiananmen Square. And they were, they were pressing for democracy the Chinese government was determined not to give up control. When protests broke out in the spring of 1989 in Tiananmen Square, tanks and troops were sent in to put down the protest. In the violence that followed, many people were killed and others were arrested and sentenced to death. This photo here really became the iconic image. It was seen in video and in photographs of this lone man standing up blocking the path of a, a line of tanks. Uh, the tanks actually would move and try to go, they change direction and try to go around him and he would keep, you know, stepping in their path, blocking their way. And, you know, this went on in a while, or for a while, you know, with him in defiance, blocking their path, till finally somebody escorted him from the scene. It's widely believed that he most likely was executed after being removed from the scene by the Chinese government, although nobody really knows for sure. Um, <coughs> and, but the police did brutally crack down on this uprising, and it became evident that China was not going to go without a fight. Now, little by little over the years, we've seen China move away from their communist economic system and move more to a mixed economy that has elements of free market capitalism but they've maintained that, that strict authoritarian control over their people. <clears throat> so, here we have our first CFU question. What was the effect of the collapse of the Soviet Union on U.S. foreign policy? And here we have the invasion of Panama. And so to have a little bit of background, you have to understand when the United States built the Panama Canal, they helped Panama gain their independence first. President Jimmy Carter had negotiated a treaty 
to turn over the canal to Panama by the year 2000. By 1989, the dictator, Manuel Noriega, was no longer cooperating with the U.S. and was involved in drug trafficking. American troops invaded Panama and arrested Noriega, where he would later be placed on charges for drug trafficking. The U.S. helped Panama to hold elections and set up a new government. The Persian Gulf War. In August of 1990, the Iraqi forces of Saddam Hussein invaded the small, oil-rich neighboring country of Kuwait. The UN condemned the invasion and ordered Hussein to withdraw his forces. Bush set up a coalition of nations and gave Hussein a deadline to withdraw. When Hussein did not withdraw his forces by the deadline, the US-led coalition began bombing targets in Iraq, followed by a ground war. The Iraqi forces were quickly defeated. So, question here is why did the U.S. go to war in the Persian Gulf? Bush's approval rating. Immediately after the Persian Gulf War, Bush's approval rating was very high. But his approval rating fell rapidly as the economy began to slip into a recession. The end of the Cold War hurt the defense industry as less military equipment was needed. This resulted in layoffs which rippled through the, uh, through the economy. Companies began downsizing or laying off employees. No new taxes. During the 1988 presidential campaign, Bush had stated, read my lips, no new taxes. So, you know, he didn't take a soft stance. This wasn't just, you know, I'm opposed to, to new tax increases. He very emphatically stated, read my lips, no new taxes. That campaign promise came back to bite him. Because with the recession, combined with the nation's high debt, really left him with a few options. Bush agreed to a tax increase in exchange for spending cuts. This came back to haunt him in the election of 1992, when the Clinton campaign regularly ran ads, attack ads, featuring him with his you know, promise of read my lips, no new taxes, and reminding us, that he did, in fact, raise taxes. So, our last CFU question for this unit, why did Bush's approval rating fall before the 1992 election?